in a word, no. ESG stands for environmental, social and governance. The environmental element of that covers what most people think of as sustainability, but ESG is a much wider concept. In a real estate context, it is closer to what a number of investors have been calling responsible property investment, but it is a set of principles that apply to all businesses around the world, not just real estate investors. Of those principles, environmental has been a significant policy and strategy issue for major real estate investors and occupiers for many years now, and has grown in profile over recent years as there's been lots of legislation on the topic, especially as businesses and governments make commitments to become net zero by 2050. But social and governance are much less established concepts. The social element of ESG is all about social value. Basically, every business operates in a community in some way and can make a contribution to that community through things like volunteering schemes, charitable donations, lending corporate support for particular projects or community needs and so on. Real estate investors and developers are no different and many already do this corporately from their main office locations. But that's only a partial solution. By their nature, many real estate assets themselves are also embedded in communities, particularly things like shopping centres, high streets, mixed-use developments. It's not enough to say that you've contributed to social value by providing somewhere that people can find work. For assets like these to really contribute, there needs to be a positive engagement with the local community to identify and respond to specific needs. We've been talking about placemaking for many years now, and that's definitely part of delivering social value, but it goes beyond that. It could include making empty retail units available to local charities or community groups, or providing space and facilities to try to meet specific local needs. Whatever is done, there needs to be a tangible output. Governance is much less an asset level issue as it goes to how a business itself is operated and managed. Again, there are easy wins here, ensuring that the leadership of a business is properly diverse and that it acts in the interests of all stakeholders are well-established principles. Many businesses will know the importance of things like good labour relations, for instance, and the need to ensure that trades unions are properly consulted on things. But good governance also means having the right policies and procedures in place and then, critically, ensuring that they're followed. And it can go beyond your own business too. We now see a lot of businesses scrutinising their own supply chains in more detail than ever before. After all, it's no good having a robust corporate human rights and modern slavery policy, for instance, only then to procure goods and services from someone who, it turns out, doesn't share your values and is potentially embarrassing or even reputationally harmful for your business, even if only by association. Far from it. It's important as it's ever been, but it's no longer the only issue to be considered. In the UK, for instance, the government has made a binding 2050 net zero commitment. And so we are seeing a raft of legislation already in force and being considered to try to deliver that. Minimum energy efficiency standards for domestic and commercial buildings were first mooted in 2011 and came into force in 2019, making it unlawful to grant new leases or to renew leases of the least energy efficient buildings unless an exemption applied and will extend to subsisting leases in 2023. There are proposals to strengthen that in the coming years and also to introduce targets for residential lenders to improve the energy performance of homes against which they make mortgage loans. There is still talk of a climate emergency and groups like Extinction Rebellion aren't going away. So environmental is definitely still a board level issue for many businesses and looks set to remain as one for years to come. I think having robust and meaningful data is going to be absolutely critical. Uh, and not only that, but it has to be comprehensible data as well. The European Union's new Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation 
comes into force in March next year and will impose new transparency obligations and periodic reporting requirements on investment management firms. That means that more and more businesses and investors are going to be seeking to understand ESG and looking for data that they can compare in order to rate and ultimately make decisions on investment opportunities. Fund managers pitching for new mandates or promoting new funds are going to have to demonstrate their performance across all three ESG areas. Whichever way you cut it, it's going to be important to demonstrate the ESG performance of a real estate fund or portfolio. Some things, such as the diversity of a board and reductions in attributable carbon emissions, can already be measured and reported. But how do you measure and compare the social value of different real estate assets? Organisations like GRESB operate well-regarded benchmarking tools for environmental metrics, but as yet, there are no established reporting tools or benchmarks for social value. And while annual reports are a good vehicle for the data relating to an organisation itself, they don't necessarily provide a consistent data set so that the wider governance performance of a business and its supply chain can be considered. So, in conclusion, the real estate industry is going to have to grapple with this, and quickly. We're already seeing steps in the right direction, but we can expect to see a lot more emphasis on data collection, reporting and benchmarking in the next few years in order to satisfy investor demands.